for a second schnapps and the bottle was gone. <laughs> so, anyhow, good morning. Uh, this morning, um, we're looking at the third, third tranche of ESR stroke PhDs. And the rationale behind this was, well, it's okay to have your fundamental rights right, although once you get it right, it changes overnight. And it's okay to create market opportunities. Um, but if you can't sustain the process of change going forward, if you can't keep your government on its toes, uh, focused and alert, then you're going to achieve something for a generation or maybe even half a generation. But you're not actually going to embed a, a dynamic of change going forward into the future. So that was the idea about putting together this kind of tranche of ESRs, PhDs. Um, and as per normal, we asked somebody, some imminent person, to do forward <laughs> perspectives in looking at the needs of government, the needs of policymakers into the future, and the needs of civil society and DPOs in terms of tooling up, skilling themselves to bring about change. Um, there was a very, very interesting tension kind of bubbling up to the surface during the three days, or the two days so far, which was that, um, sure, we need knowledge, sure, we need information, um, and no rational government could pursue policy making without them, but yet we had the cautionary tale from Andre that actually, guys, that's not the way it works. So it'd be really, really interesting to see not just what kind of data mines you've opened up, but your thoughts about how you generate the traction between that and the process of change. So. With that, over to Jerome. Just like that? Yeah. Well, that's good, because that's what I was addressing. Um, I'm glad I didn't prepare for Hold this. Uh, I'm glad I, do you really need, okay. I'm glad I didn't prepare for this uh, ahead of time. Not that I was given a lot of time to prepare anyway. But it was very important to listen, because the dynamics that were happening over the last couple of days actually create something that is very interesting about the nature of progressive change in the, at the end of the day. Um, and so I want to address that, and I want to address it simultaneously in a way in which empowers, hopefully, our four ESRs by the time we get started. Um, uh, empowers our ESRs. It's a Greek thing, isn't it? I mean, to just be fashionably late for these things. I'm just joking. Anyway, uh, we, we are missing one, so that's why I'm, I'm speaking in these terms. Um, um, Andrea, Carly, Stelios, and Demetrius, I want to make sure that they're integrated in their research, their powerful ideas, and the research that they have done is integrated into this third tranche um, in, in a way which displays their voyage, their travel, what they have done, and what they're contributing uh, uh, to this endeavor, and I will try to weave that into what I want to say. Um, the way this thing has <coughs> panned itself out in the last couple of days is that there's a clear uh, process content distinction, and I, maybe it's just because of my background in philosophy, there's always uh, a temptation on my part to think in terms of dichotomies that are what we call countervailing, that is to say you push one and the other one has to recede, and you pu push the other one, the other one. So they seem to be, if not in conflict, then at least in a kind of tension. And to use what in my background has always been feminist methodologies to show that these things can be not resolved, but in a, in a sense synthesized or interacted in, in a way which is very phenomenal. Uh, and I want to use that as the dynamic here. Uh, there are actually three components uh, to this discussion. One is the institutional arrangements which are required or would be required for an agenda of sustained change because it's clear that the only way, well, there he is, the only way to, uh, to ensure that the, the dream continues is, is to have institutions in place and processes in place that Power, sustain, and keep keep uh, the progress over. I mean, the alternative, and I'm here's I'm starting to get the contrast. I, I will call this the, the Andre approach, just to be as unfair as possible to Andre. And that is, how do you do change? 
Well, every while, once in a while, you burn a car, okay? And that's it. Oh, they burned another car. And if you do it that way, you end up with spasms of change, um, reactive change, uncoordinated, or if you would like, irrational change that only addresses reactively the particular emergency, or in this case, car fire, that is happening. Now, we have lots of experience of that approach, and it produces very interesting results in the short term, and then perverted results in the middle and long term. Perverted because governments will react, overreact in response to that kind of assault, and do things which you don't want to don't want to happen. So, on the one side, there is this, and you'll see what I'm aiming at here, passionate response to change, the driver of change. On the other hand, there's a kind of sober second thought, as was characterized the American Supreme Court, the response to stepwise movement that is more sustainable. So there's this kind of contrast. So you have institutional structures and arrangements and processes primarily that are needed. And I, I am going to be relying on the two lawyers. Well, there are all, there are three actually, but the two the two lawyers, um, uh, Andre had looked at um, anti discrimination law in, in the context of the CRPD, <laughs> and Estelius who looked at Article Nine, the accessibility, say, to 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 give us some hints about their perceptions of the arrangements within the legal context. There is another focus of this tranche, which is the one that I picked up um, for my work package, and that, that is the preconditions for rational uh, policy formation. Now, rationality gets a bad rep occasionally, and as does knowledge, and I'm going to address that uh, very, very quickly. Uh, but that is the focus of what I want to talk about. The last one is securing the utility of research for, um, for maximal effect on policy. And that will come out in the discussions, both using Demetrius and uh, Carly, and perhaps all three of them. So I'm looking at preconditions for rational policy formation, or what is sometimes called evidence-based policy. So bear with me with the title, evidence-based policy, knowledge translation, there go by various names. But evidence-based policy is the approach to policy development which is grounded in the kind of evidence which research and which we're concerned that research have an impact on. I think I screwed up that sentence. Anyway, the issue of evidence-based policy <coughs> is that it is evidence-based. And I'm gonna talk about that. But in a very tangential and skewed fashion, I'm gonna talk about the contrast between reason and passion an age-old philosophic <clears throat> contravailing tension, reason and passion, because it struck me that actually what's going on here at the deeper level between how do you get change to happen, how do you have those, those ideas, the moral compass that CRPD gives us, the direction, the power, I'm thinking of the animation, the power that m makes it possible for there to be change. And on the other hand, how do you get that change to be channeled, controlled, and put into a context which is sustainable? So I think of uh, ultimately what we have is a reason versus passion dispute. Now, there are strengths to each, and if you, if you like, without the passion, reason is idle, it doesn't have anything to work on, and without the reason, passion is dangerous. It's burning cars. And I'll give you some exa well, not examples, but I'll play with that in a second. The feminist insight in the reason passion is, come on, guys, they're mutually supportive. They interact in ways that require each other and produce a synthetic compound, if you like, which gives you the drive, the passion, the ideas, the moral compass, in a way which is sustainable, 
and provides continuity and progressive change through time. So that's what I, that's, uh, I'm playing with that for the next five minutes. Let, understand in this context passion to be the force, the driving force, the animation for change, and reason to be what I'm going to call intersubjective support, not ob objective support, because there may, objectivity is a kind of fraudulent position, I would have thought. Intersubjectivity, meaning the combination in the commons, in a common area, for, inter, <coughs> for subjects to interact. So reason gives us intersubjective support, reliability and transparency, and evidence-based policy. So that's the contrast. Um, Reason, as I said, spins its wheels without a moral compass, and um, but passion itself on its own, and I have three quotes, and I'm going to start with the first one. No case of intentionally created human misery, studied in cool indifference to human suffering or calculated brutality that has stained human history has not been planned and executed by people convinced of the moral superiority of their ideology or canonical belief and an unbending refusal to compromise their principles or seek common ground. That's passion un unmodulated by reason. There is no form of human misery that has not been instigated by passion unleashed without a modulation without a, I don't want to say control, but it's, 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 there's a subtle relationship, which I don't know, but I am hoping that in the context we will, we will discover it. What we want is a creative tension between the two, and it strikes me <clears throat> that instead of having research controlled by passion, which is a, in a sense a kind of partisan research, where you go through and you find the facts that support your position and you bring those to bear. It's, uh, it's the kind of research which, at least I was trained to be, to identify as scholarly, a scholarly problem. You go into a problem looking at both sides, <laughs> giving them an equal voice, and you find to the best of your ability the evidence or the reasoning or the argumentation that gives you some way of thinking that the preponderance of support is on one side or, or rather than the other. Because most of these problems are so sitting on a fence that there's not a clear yes or no. They're wicked problems, as uh, someone said yesterday or the day before. They're wicked problems, and they're wicked primarily because their, their answers are not self-evident. The problem with passion-led, the problem with passion-led research is everything becomes self-evident. Not only is it us versus them, it's the position that we have to educate people on. Whenever I hear that I understand passion is in the driver's seat, namely I have this and I have to, my opponents don't have a countervailing position that I have to take seriously. They just have to be washed of that position and educated into my position. This is a problem which is instilled by a lopsided understanding of the joint power and creativity that passion and reason can do together. Okay, there is, I think, a resolution in that I call, in this context, universality. And what I mean by universality is simply that a recognition that we're all in it together, that we're all dependent creatures to Martha Feynman and the rest, that we all are vulnerable in ways, that we share common features, and you've heard many times my story that disability is not something that some people have, it's a common human condition, that we all have if we're lucky enough to be old, to live an old, um, to live to be an older individual or, or in other kinds of cases. So that disability is, is a function of what Shylock in The Merchant of Venice said, prick me and I bleed. That is to say, 
It is something, I may be Jewish, but I still am human. I may be this, but I still am human because I have the capacity to be vulnerable. And that's universality in my understanding of it. And if you concentrate on universality and turn to what I think is the resolution process between reason and passion, and that is negotiation. So the focus, the process focus that I want to instill is that evidence-based policy is grounded in negotiation in mutual respect. So that all parties, governments, NGOs, people with disabilities, physicians, or whatever the evil, the, op uh, the opposing party, all parties are, first of all, have a seat at the table. That's a precondition. All parties can speak. All parties are respected as components in a negotiated position. And all those things are not easy to achieve. And we have seen in the CRPD and the discussions that have happened, the, the difficulties that have to be overcome to get people with disabilities in the context and the political power to be able to have a seat at the table. That's the crucial pre preliminary step to everything that I, I think is powerful in the resolution of this debate. So evidence-based policy, the preconditions for rational decision-making, the preconditions for evidence-based policy is that it's dialogic, that it involves a discussion, a dialogue between all parties in a context of mutual respect. It is grounded in equality there is no presumption that we have, an, we have an idea that we need to educate you in. It's, we have an idea which we can interact with your ideas to see if we can re re negotiate a common position. Grounded in equality and seeking intersubjective agreement, which is invariably, almost by definition, a compromise. So the negotiated resolution of the passion reason dispute, which I'm using as a tool to understand evidence-based policy, is grounded in equality, as it should be, grounded in transparent dialogue, open dialogue, seeking a compromise that is intersubjective. Okay, so that's that's more or less what I want to talk about. I mean there are technical tools, and one of the uh, features of this tranche was to, to look at the possibility of indicators for monitoring the convention. And for me, uh, Article 31 of the convention is actually one of the most dynamic and interesting ones because it is sitting at the interface between reason and passion, if you think about it, because what it is is saying you have a right to have information collected that goes to the question of whether the state is successfully implementing the vision in, in, in the convention. So it, in a sense, it's bringing reason into the service of the vision, and the vision is modulated by the evidence that you provide. Because the CRPD, the vision doesn't create facts. The vision creates goals. The facts, as a good pragmatist John Charles Pierce once said, facts are hard things. <laughs> you can't ignore them. Stubborn. You hit your head and stub your toe on them. So you can manipulate them and you can educate people into them, but if they ain't true, it doesn't do much good because you'll always stumble over them. Facts is facts, unfortunately. So the best thing to do is to go for evidence that's valid, that is true. Now the passion response, the burning cars in the street the response is, true, who's true, my true, you're true. What's knowledge, my knowledge, your knowledge? Okay, that's passion going off on its own. In a context of sustained implementation, we need intersubjective agreement, we need negotiation based, and we create 
the, dom the domain of facts. We create mm. what it is that we want. Okay, um, as I said, um, and I will end with one quote, one last quote. The, um, the technical stuff, the statistical stuff, the use of data is essential. <clears throat> it can turn into a parlor <coughs> game and it can, it can be um, a, a focus of its own. But it's always important to realize that this information can change your views. I'm, yes, I'm just, an example that came out yesterday, the figure of 15% of people with disabilities in the world, one billion people in the world was cited. Now this figure comes from the World Report on Disability, which is a, a fantastic piece of, of evidence-based uh, policy recommendations. And it is, if you like, the best epidemiological statement of the prevalence of disability in the world, and I mean best absolutely top, tip-top science. Now, if you look at the 15%, you will discover one interesting thing. About 75, 80% of those people you would not call disabled. 75 or 80% of those people have chronic health conditions. If you're, if you're, they have COPD, they have something that affects ADLs, that is, say, activities of daily lifting. They're not blind, they're not <coughs> deaf. They're not in a wheelchair. Wheelchair, people <laughs> in a wheelchair accounts for about half of a percent of people with disabilities in the, in the world. Mobility difficulties, maybe 3%, maybe 3%. The most dominant, if you're looking at condition-based disability, the most dominant prevalent form of disability is depression, by far. And depression has this interesting feature of it, and that is there's almost nothing you could do to the world to remove obstacles. And depression is a very interesting and very difficult form of depression because it saps from your life, saps from your life the capacity to enjoy it, and really having friends doesn't matter, having colleagues who have been educated in depression to make your life in the workplace better has no effect. We have evidence of that. In fact, almost nothing has effect except medication. And that is the primary, mm -hmm. if you're just looking at numbers, the primary prevalent example mm -hmm. of what is, what is disability in the world. Now, that is a bit of fact. It can't be sidestepped. It is something you hit your knee against, and uh, the knee gives way, not the chair. When we're looking at disability human rights, we have to take disability as it is. And as it is, is not a matter of accommodating people in wheelchairs, although that's obviously it. It's a matter of dealing with the fact that sometimes medication is the solution. And that is not something that is an ideologically generated position. That is a factually generated position. So occasionally facts really, really, really help. Now, how do you sustain change? Well, I think four messages. One, I really have always been enamored by Irving Zola's move to universal disability policy, which in a recent publication I said, what is universalizing disability? It means the disappearance of disability. Disab disability disappears mm -hmm. as a category. It was invented as a category for administrative purposes to segregate people so that special treatment goes here and normal treatment. So <coughs> our aim is to get rid of the minority model, to get rid of the view that people with disabilities are a discrete and insular minority, et cetera, et cetera, and move toward the sensible, I would have thought, position that disability is a feature of what it means to be a human. So let's look at humanity and don't look at, I mean, people first. I mean, it's always been a message. Um, secondly, cynicism and skepticism. Well, what's knowledge for me is not knowledge for you, etc. That kind of skepticism about the possibility of intersubjective agreement and the cynicism, I'm sorry, Andre. I mean, you didn't really mean all this, but the cynicism <laughs> of saying, what works? You burn cars, okay? 
that cynicism, as I mentioned and, and, and Rosemary picked up, is a good, passionate driver, but it has to modulate, it has to end at some point, and segue into trust. If you stay with cynicism, you burn cars, you get results, they last, poof, they're over. You'll never sustain uh, change with cynicism. And from my point of view, you never sustain change by saying, facts, who cares about facts? <coughs> Data, it always says the same thing. You have to have a sustained directional <laughs> input into the conversation. Optimism, good faith, and mutual respect. I'm talking about Pollyannish. I mean, that's my understanding of how you move forward. Good faith and uh, respect. Last quote. Securing alliances, sorry, the significance of research lies in the possibility that people can change themselves to a degree, that they can achieve at least some small betterment, that they can ameliorate some problems. They, in fact, often fail, and in some dimensions, always fail. <coughs> For between the complexity of the social world and the human thinking capacity, there exists a tragic discrepancy. But the possibility remains that sometimes, in some circumstances, people can to some degree succeed. And it's with that optimism, that modulated, frank, realistic op optimism, that I think the resolution of the passion that is needed for a social movement and the reason that is needed for sustaining progressive change can come together in the power of mutually respected negotiation, finding common ground. Our ESRs, in one way or another, responded to that. And I'm going to turn to the, the modulator. How do you want to proceed? Because I'll just say I a few words. There. Okay. <laughs> um, excellent. This brought me back to my philosophy days of pragmatism and William James and so forth. I think the distinction you're bringing out in the antinomy and the tension between reason and passion as drivers, whether so or combined drivers of change, is really, really interesting. And maybe another way of putting it is the tension between facts and values. Um, and I was actually steeped in legal realism in my education, and one of the key tenets of the legal realists is not just skepticism about values. Remember Oliver Wendell Holmes' famous phrase, when you come across a new principle, pour some cynical acid over it and see if anything of substance remains, which is very much the pragmatic yeah, yeah. tradition. Mm -hmm. But they were also fact skeptics. And one of the interesting points they made is that you can be great at excavating the facts. You can be great at painting a three-dimensional picture of the way life is for certain groups of people and so forth. But in doing so, there's almost an intrinsic conservative backward bias in that endeavor. Because, of course, the reason why the facts are accepted is because someone over time has accepted them. So simply by demonstrating and adding granularity to the facts, to use your lovely word, which I, I always <laughs> dig up, um, doesn't necessarily even get to first base in terms of motivating others to begin a process of change. Um, it might persuade them to um, adjust the knobs a little bit to try and reduce some negative impacts. Um, but the way in which it triggers change is that if there's a shift of values or if there are deep legacy values that you can say you profess <coughs> equality but this is how you treat that group but then you're up against embedded mental reservations that every culture has for example equality is great well the roma is a little bit of a problem there or people with disabilities there's a little bit of a problem there so just by demonstrating that segregated education is X, Y, and Z outcome for people with disabilities, uh, I, I would say it doesn't even get you to first base. 
-hmm. it might be if there's sort of um, a crisis of legitimacy within the system, and then you can nudge the policymakers one way rather than the other. Uh, but in and of themselves, I'm not so sure. Um, so, so then the question becomes, uh, and if you're burning cars, it should be burning cars to put a mirror to people and say, actually, you say you believe this, but you do exactly the opposite. But no culture likes to look at itself in the mirror. We don't like to acknowledge, um, you, you got the facts right, and we've accepted treating unmarried mothers the way we have in the past in this country, but guess what? That was just the value system of the 1950s and 1960s. So I'll hand it over to the ESRs, and, and we begin with Andrea. And it'd be interesting just to hear not only your project, because in a sense that's just knowledge and information, but how you think about these issues, how you connect them up to the broader uh, scheme of change, and where you come down to in terms of this antinomy yeah. between facts and values or reason and passion as drivers of change. Over to you, Andrea. Do you want me to make my presentation or just generally? Both. Both, okay. Both. <laughs> okay, um, well, my name is Andrea Broderick and um, my journey in the Dream Project has really come full circle because I actually started here in NUIG as a young undergraduate law student taught by Professor Quinn, among others. So I started. Yes, <laughs> I survived. <laughs> yeah. So I started here in NUIG and when I left, I went on my own merry way to uh, qualify and start to practice as a solicitor. I thought this was the be all and end all for me, what I wanted to do, but in fact it wasn't. Um, and then I searched for something a bit more meaningful, I suppose, and I came back here to NUIG to do the LLM in Disability Law and Policy, and that's really where I found my, my passion for um, this this area and for research in general. And then I kind of fell into the dream project almost um, by coincidence because when I finished um, the LLM there was a position available. So that's, that's where I am now. I'm situated in Maastricht University, finishing off my, um, my topic for the dream project. So my topic is equality and non-discrimination, full and effective participation uh, for persons with disabilities. And I'm basically looking at um, coming up with a definitive interpretation of the quality and non-discrimination norms. So I look at Article 5 and Article 2, which contains the definition of reasonable accommodation, among other definitions. So what I really was tasked to do with my project was to um, look at equality and non-discrimination from a theoretical and a comparative perspective. So I'm looking at what does equality mean in theory in the UN Convention and where can we situate equality within um, the international arena. So how does equality in the Convention fit within uh, the concepts of disability and the models of equality which have already been seen in international law? And does, does the UNCRPD go further than um, the already elaborated theories of disability and models of equality. So in terms of um, what I found in my project, and Rosemary Caius already um, explained this very well the other day, the model of equality in the UNCRPD is very progressive. It's a substantive model of equality. And my project has shown that it's, it's actually at the furthest end of substantive equality. So it's a substantive disadvantage model. It tries to um, target deep-rooted structural inequalities and asymmetrical um, disadvantage and oppression. So really it's a very progressive model of equality, but this is all very well and good, having the progressive model of equality in the UN CRPD, and this ties into the topic of, the, of Jerome's presentation. How does this work in practice, the theory of change? So um, I have found that the UN CRPD, it strengthens the international norm, the international equality norm. It includes reasonable accommodation within the non-discrimination paradigm. And this helps to progress from universal equality to actually individualized application of equality in theory. And the social model of disability obviously um, seeks to target deep-rooted structural inequalities in society. Uh, the fact that the UNCRPD has a multi-dimensional or intersectional approach to equality is also 
also very uh, progressive. But the problem is that there's a lot of barriers to translating this into um, hard non-discrimination <coughs> law and individually justi justiciable rights for persons with disabilities. So during my project, I was very conscious that, yes, I have this lovely chapter on how the UNCRPD is so progressive, but how does that actually help persons with disabilities in practice? Um, so what I did was I, I, I looked at, I carried out a case study on um, the European Court of Human Rights and I tried to figure out, well, is this model of equality actually going anywhere? Is it um, having any influence? So I looked at whether it was having any influence on the case law of the European Court of Human Rights to date and whether there's a potential future influence of the convention. So what I found was that actually the UNCRPD is having some influence, not, um, I would say, a decisive influence to date, but it is having some influence on um, the legal system, the judicial system, and my project is very legal, so I apologise for anyone who's non-legal, but um, it is having some influence on the case law of the Court of Justice. The UNCRPD has in my opinion, it seems to be pushing the court towards scrutinizing a bit more closely the rights of persons with disabilities. And there have been many recent cases, such as the Glor case, Glor versus Switzerland, in which the court uh, referred to the UNCRPD um, and actually referred to it as an example of a European and worldwide consensus on the need to protect people with disabilities from discrimination and the need to foster full and effective participation in society. So that's quite significant. Um, it doesn't mean that the court is fully on board with the UNCRPD or the spirit and tenor of the convention, but the fact that it's citing the UNCRPD as an example of a consensus is a start. And in that case, several authors have commented that that case can be seen as kind of implicit recognition of some, for some form of accommodation obligations um, by the court, because the court commented that the individual in question, the disabled individual in question, um, should have been granted special forms of service because of his disability. <coughs> now, it didn't explicitly recognize reasonable accommodations, but it, it did seem to kind of uh, begin um, to recognise some some form of accommodation obligation. There have been many recent cases which have both, uh, we'll say, positive signs and negative signs of the court's understanding of the UNCRPD. And in my research, some of the cases, such as there's an, a case called Alogis Kits versus Hungary, that case both demonstrates positive signs and negative signs because the court kind of commented on socially constructed stereotypes, it commented on the fact that it, it talked about the UNCRPD, but it didn't actually explicitly rely on the UNCRPD, we'll say. Uh, the, the applicant in that case had argued that his rights should have been interpreted in line with the UNCRPD, and specifically Article 12 and Article 29, which concern uh, the right to legal capacity and uh, participation in political life. And the funny thing is that while the court didn't actually rely on the UNCRPD, it seems to have taken uh, the applicant's arguments on board in narrowing the margin of appreciation to the state, which is quite significant because in the uh, subsequent case of Kayutin versus Russia, the court again seems to have kind of taken the UNCRPD into account in, in the standard of scrutiny. So while it again didn't fully kind of go with the spirit and tenor of the CRPD. It, it seems to show some signs that it recognises the CRPD and that this might have an influence on the interpretation of equality for persons with disabilities. The disappointing part of Alogis Kiss is that the court recognises considerable discrimination against persons with disabilities. It specifically links this to the margin of appreciation, but then it doesn't consider for example, the provision of reasonable accommodation to the applicant. So it says that the, the applicant, um, a blanket ban on persons with disabilities, the right to vote is unacceptable. However, it doesn't actually consider the fact that perhaps reasonable accommodations could have been considered to help the applicant exercise the right to vote, we'll say. 
So on one hand, the court is being, you know, slightly progressive, but on the other hand, completely not. So it's kind of a, a two-way uh, balancing act, I suppose. There's a very recent case, I don't want to go on for too long about the case law, but there's a very recent case, IB versus police, yeah, yeah, goes, and that's again a funny case because the court, on the one hand, didn't even mention the CRPD or the social model, but on the other hand, the court actually took the social model of disability into account in uh, the application of Article 8. Yeah, I can sum up. <laughs> um, so it took the, the social model of disability specifically <coughs> into account in the application of the right to private life and also in considering whether there was an objective and reasonable um, justification for the treatment. So that just shows again the court is not fully engaging with CRPD on the one hand, uh, but yet it is taking some of the CRPD's values into account in interpreting the rights of persons with disabilities. Just so basically to sum up, what I'm trying to say is that my interpre uh, interpretation of the equality and non-discrimination norm is very progressive and several other authors as well. However, is this actually having a uh, substantive influence on the rights of persons with disabilities? That's debatable and whether it will in the future is also debatable. Okay. So. So um, we're going to hear all four first and then open it up to the floor and I see a number of people already <laughs> itching to go forward. But really, in terms of the reason-passion divide, in terms of the fact-value divide, your work is pretty much on the value side of yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the problematic there is that who could be against equality for all, including people with disabilities? But then it's really how to how you frame that, and if you notice, lots and lots and lots of weasel words in the convention about on an equal basis with others, which gave a lot of states comfort that what they had been doing can continue, because hell, the facts show us you are different, the facts show us you're in different situations. Of course, there's an inherent conservatism in the facts, and there's a lot of politics about facts and how you frame them. But at, at first blush, the facts show us you are different. You can't make your own decisions. And even in the Kish case, um, there was mental reservations in the part of the court that, of course, there are certain categories of people who can't make their own decisions. And if the states didn't have a deep theory of equality, you betcha the courts don't have a deep mm. theory of equality. So let's go over to the fact side and the, the, um, the reason side of the divide and give it to Stelios. Am I the fact side? I think you are. <laughs> Bring up the rear. <laughs> OK. So I'm um, Stelios Haifaitis. Uh, my project was about uh, the way the European Union will implement Article 9 of the Convention on Accessibility. So the idea was that the EU ratified this Human Rights Convention, this is a momentum occasion, and then what do you have to do to implement the Convention? So I'm trying to answer this question a little bit. Uh, I think my, my research is trying to combine a little bit of that, uh, but also it's on the value, mostly on the value side, to be honest. I'll try to, to integrate what uh, Gerard and Jerome talked about today with, uh, with some ideas that I have, some conclusions I have from my own research. They're not very specific, but they're general about the process of change. Um, so looking uh, looking at the challenges to the process of change with regards to accessibility, Kira talked about that a little bit yesterday, and the second panel also talked about it. But certainly, the fact, the costs that are associated with accessibility are the major barrier to implement Article Nine of the Convention. And I always thought that the Convention was ratified at the most opportunate time, while the crisis was happening in 2008. Yeah. And this actually aggravated the situation. And from also from my experience at the European Disability Forum, uh, working at the Impact Assessment for the Accessibility Act, it, it is obvious to me that now policymakers are not looking just at, the, they are mostly focused at the immediate costs and the immediate benefits that a legislative measure might have, and they're not looking at the future potential of a fully inclusive 
market, which is very disappointing. And it's also going back to what Gerard and Jerome said, what, what can we do when actually our values, let's say the UNCRPD, is not enough and the facts do not support, let's say, taking measures on making our cell phones accessible. What we can do as policymakers then? And to be honest, I don't know, certainly what uh, Robert is doing is uh, exceptional and is certainly he's looking at the websites and it's very important to have data because in reality we don't have much data on uh, whether it will be financially beneficial even in the long run. But I think uh, what we can do is actually change attitude and make people understand the, the actual mm -hmm. situation of people with disabilities and how they, both the public domain and the private domain, contribute to a barrier-filled society. So that's about the, <laughs> as much as we about the finances. Mm -hmm. And I'll move to the EU, which is the more about institutional barriers. So looking at the uh, looking at, at the EU legislation on accessibility, I think it, it is quite evident that it's really scarce all over the areas of EU law. It's not very comprehensive most of the times, but it's also not consistent. So you can see some areas of EU law having some reference to disability or accessibility requirements, but others not having such uh, references. And also the terminology that is used is different. You can see that in some cases they use disabled people, for example, but in other cases they use handicapped. Or they, they, say they put disabled people, as uh, Yeva talked yesterday, in the vulnerable consumers category, which is not addressing the particular needs of people with disabilities. So this, this shows that there is a lack of cooperation yeah. between the directors at the commission the commission levels, so the directors and the commissioners also. And certainly there is a need of cooperation, and while I was in the EDF, there were some conferences of commissioners, but I don't think this is sufficient to have a more comprehensive and consistent implementation of the convention at the EU level. Now, the second thing I want to talk about, also it was discussed a little bit by Magdi yesterday, but basically a lot, I think, but not from that perspective. So Magdi talked about the formulation of the monitoring mechanism by the Commission and at the EU level, I looked at the actual reporting of the Commission uh, on the implementation of several uh, EU instruments. And what I found out is that there usually, or most of the times, let's say, the, the reports do not include uh, uh, reference to how the member states implemented uh, several provisions that are on accessibility or disability. And I think this is because the legislation, the, not the legislation, but a disability is mainstreamed in broader legislative measures. And as a result, sometimes, because also it's just one provision, let's say, or one paragraph, it's lost in, in, <laughs> in the process of monitoring and there's no reference. So we don't have actual data on how member states have implemented several uh, provisions uh, with regards to uh, disability. So that's quite disappointing and the Commission has a lot of work to do to improve this because we need data as we talk about now. So that is very important. And uh, to see if it's actually implemented but also if it's actually effective. Uh, and lastly, uh, in a broader context, so the EU is a uh, international organization. It has certain powers that are conferred to it by the member states. So for the, let's say, and its exclusive powers are very limited. So for the states like where I come from, which is Greece, <laughs> to, to wait for the EU to take all the measures to implement the convention is very wrong <laughs> because it doesn't have much power to do so. So most of the areas of the convention are actually addressed at the, uh, are actually part of the shared competencies of the EU, which means that these competencies are shared between the EU and the member states. So in that case, it is highly <laughs> problematic that we do not know between the two who sh should take the measures to implement the convention. And this is a 
very difficult question to answer. I'm trying to answer it in my thesis. But the thing is, the EU has tried to do, to clarify a little bit the issue of competences. They have the council decision and the code of conduct, but they didn't su succeed particularly in clarifying this issue. So it's very essential for the member states and the EU to coordinate their action. Otherwise, we won't have a comprehensive implementation of the convention, but also there's a danger of overlap of legislation and a danger of um, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so there's a danger of overlap, but also there's a danger of inaction. So maybe we'll have some inaction because nobody will know who should take the first step to implement the convention. So lastly, going back to what Jerome said, and I think values are very important. I think values are, I think drivers. It's not. It's important also to combine them with data. If you don't have something to prove your arguments, then it's very problematic. You should, you should be balanced, of course. But I have an example from my research that I think values pushed me to look at the issue, uh, this issue. And this issue was the accessibility of private residential buildings. Mm. So Article 9 of the Convention says that member states should take measures to ensure um, uh, access to goods and services open and provided to the public. And uh, throughout the convention, looking at, at the interpretation, the context of the convention, there is no reference to private residential buildings. And looking at the object and the purpose of, the, of uh, accessibility, so what it aims, it aims at guaranteeing independent living and full per and effective participation in all aspects of life. So if throughout the convention there's no reference to residential buildings, how, how people with disabilities are supposed to have independent living if they cannot find a house? And we cannot expect, for example, for the state to provide pu accessible public housing mm -hmm. to all. So yeah, my point is, this was the vi my personal values and the values of the convention pushed me to look at this issue. I won't give you an answer, but yeah, okay. this is it. Take a sec. Thanks very much, Stelios. I mean, I guess there's two very important things coming out there. There's, if you think gathering the facts and presenting them objectively is problematical, because there's always politics in facts, and if you think there's always a subtle bias drawing us back to the past, so what, what is, is what ought to be, that's really the story, then it's even worse when you come to trying to imagine what things might be if, if there were certain policy changes, and then if there are certain advantages that we can monetize, put our finger on, and say there aren't just costs, there are benefits. But what you're really asking people to do is imagine a utopia that's different from the reality that they've become used to. Uh, so the politics element is incredibly important in impact assessment, for example. And the other thing that comes through, I think, maybe accidentally, but it's a very interesting one to bring to the surface, if the majority of competence remain with the member states, and if most member states act as they have in the past, which is, I mean, they say in, in the US Air Force, set and forget, yeah. sign and ratify and just continue as before, mm -hmm. right? It does raise the very interesting possibility that the best value of the European Union is not to draft law and enforce law, but to stand apart to try and valorize uh, the value shift and hopefully through time that will help you know, change expectations and mindsets. So, okay, over to Carly now. Hi, everyone. I'm Carly. Um, before I get into my research uh, topic, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on my journey here to the final conference of Dream. So I am a lawyer, as Jerome mentioned, but before applying for the, the Dream position, I had no idea about disability rights. I had studied human rights generally and knew there was a disability convention but I, I was just um, completely uh, you know, new to the area. Actually, before the interview, I had to study a little bit to make sure I knew <laughs> what I was talking about. But um, before this position, I did work in tort law, and I defended asbestos companies, uh, companies that made asbestos. And then I went into uh, work for the US government, and I worked to deport people. So. 
my my uh, karma was looking pretty bad. So. <laughs> I realized this is exactly the position that I needed. And coming in with kind of a blank slate left me as very moldable clay. And this, the interactions I've had with the other ESRs and the PIs and all the, the speakers that are the, really the leaders of the disability rights world um, just were able to mold me and help me make my own perspective on, on disability <coughs> rights and disability human rights. And, um, I just want to thank the Dream Network for that overall. So originally my work package um, was more in line with what Jerome talked about, with indicator development and monitoring and data and how, that sta how states could best achieve this. Um, but after, after some time I realized that I can't be passionate about this. I need to work on a topic that, that I find some interest in and that I can really dedicate myself to. So, I read the convention through a few times and looked looked at the different articles and, and saw where I could put my own personal passion into my research. And I found that this was through education, or through the, the right to education. And this was inspired by, I give a little shout out to my brother Michael, <laughs> but um, he uh, was a struggling student all his life and failing almost every class. And it wasn't until uh, we argued that he needed an accommodation to, um, to, to be able to succeed. Um, that was in his last year of high school, and he went from a failing student to a straight-A student with a small accommodation, and just graduated college this year, so really excited about that. Um, so I decided to focus my research on education and how every child could be given a good education, an education that was individualized and able to support their own needs. And I found a gap in, in the law um, that many states have inclusion policies. Um, however, these policies are not practiced. They're not implemented. And this disparity between uh, policy and practice really inspired me to focus on education and or inclusive education for children with disabilities. And not only was it my own passion, but it's, it's a really important topic. I mean, the Disability Strategy 2010 to 2020 specifically says that inclusive education needs to be promoted for children with disabilities. And we know that inclusion, inclusive education is a state obligation. However, it, it's, not, it's not happening. Um, so my research really argues that it's not only a top-down uh, implementation that's needed from you know, from the government down to the students, but it's also a bottom-up implementation strategy that's needed. There are so many barriers um, to inclusive education, and these range from structural, financial, and, and of course, attitudinal barriers. Um, so these these need to be taken down, and, and I'm looking at them and, and how state parties are obliged to take these barriers down. But also, part of my research will come back to my original work package. And that's how to monitor that inclusive education is actually being realized. So I'm going to look at indicators on how um, inclusive edu education is progressively realized. And um, from this, um, I hope to, uh, or to look at how Jerome explained evidence-based policy, that I will show evidence and that this is why, <coughs> why this policy needs to be made and continued. And like all of us, I want my, my research to actually make a change in, in what I'm looking at. And our job at researchers is to really show why and how uh, states, states need to change and how we can make this change happen. So I think that, or I hope that my research can provide kind of the backbone for the argument of change and that but through my passion and then mixing that passion with facts that I'm finding uh, can, can actually help the world to be a better place. <laughs> Thanks. So it's really interesting the kind of pattern that's emerging because, uh, you know, Andrea is very much um, on the side of the angels in terms of a deep substantive theory of equality, although the facts certainly don't stack up. And 
the way others frame equality is nowhere near uh, where you ideally would like to be. Um, likewise, I think with Stelios and Carly, I think it's your passion that's coming through. And, but the, the problem there is how do you communicate to somebody who does not have these values? Uh, there's kind of an incommensurability of values going on here. And it's very interesting to hear how you think through how you reach somebody who has exactly the opposite value system and who can point to the facts and say that's just the way it is. So last but certainly not least, over to Demetrius. Uh, 
uh, we're now in a point that we can conclude that certainly there is a right to access to rehabilitation services and uh, rehabilitation in the convention is a, is a means to an end. It's seen as a precondition, as an enabler, as Professor Peter Blanc said before uh, yesterday, is an enabler for, uh, for achieving independence, equality, uh, autonomy, and uh, maximum level of, uh, of uh, functioning. Uh, this is also of course with, uh, with a recent communication from the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, which uh, assessed uh, 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 a case of uh, HM against uh, Sweden uh, two years ago. Uh, and uh, they, they conclude that uh, 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 rehabilitation is an obligation of the state and uh, is, a, uh, is a precondition, an axiomatic, I would say, precondition for, uh, for independence. Uh, <coughs> so, for uh, uh, getting into uh, into the uh, uh, into the point of, uh, of uh, this panel discussion on how you are achieving policy changes, uh, I will now come to discuss my experiences from uh, my secondment. I had the opportunity to uh, uh, to be seconded to uh, the World Health Organization for uh, for six months and uh, uh, monitor actually uh, not monitor but but participate in the in the in the processes. Uh, that they have uh, 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 have uh, resulted in uh, uh, in the uh, in several uh, documents like the uh, disability resolution last last year in the World Health Assembly, uh, the rehabilitation guidelines project, and uh, other significant projects. Uh, uh, this is where the whole journey begins because uh, the the opportunity because the fact that I had the opportunity to be exposed to such an environment uh, actually. Gave me the, uh, uh, made me uh, capable of uh, understanding the interrelationship between the different actors that they have sit on the table and discuss all the all, all these important issues with regards to health rehabilitation and and prevention. Uh, uh, the world report on disability, as Professor Dickenbach mentioned before, is uh, and here we come to discuss about uh, evidence-based policy making. is a report that summarizes the best available scientific evidence on on disability. And uh, proposes some proposes to states, to governments, what, what kind of action they should take. Proposes specific policy measures in order to achieve this change and to implement the convention. However, when I was in the secondment, I had the opportunity to read through Ida's responses on the World Report on Disability and see how the International Disability Alliance responded to that. And it was uh, really uh, surprising to see that the uh, International Disability Alliance thought that this report should not have been produced by the World Health Organization, but by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. <laughs> and there, you see, it was the first, the very first lesson I learned, is the experience and learning of the interrelations between uh, the disability community, the disability movement, the health movement, movement, and the international actors who have a constitutional obligation to promote the health of the people and the promotion of and the implementation, uh, excuse me, for, of, uh, of the rights of persons with disabilities. Uh, the second uh, learning opportunity, important opportunity I had uh, in the World Health Organization is when uh, I participated in the process of drafting the general comment uh, for, the, uh, for the CRC, for the Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, which was a general comment on the right of the child to the highest attainable standard of health. And uh, I saw the entire process of how a general comment uh, passes through uh, several departments of the World Health Organization uh, to, uh, uh, to reach at the stage when the UNICEF has the final point uh, to make all the suggestions and the revisions of, of, a, of a general comment and uh, clearly this has uh, contributed to my, to my knowledge. Uh, in, uh, in the end, uh, uh, my second I had the opportunity to participate in the preparations of the World Health uh, Assembly uh, when the uh, disability resolution was uh, adopted by, uh, by the member states. Uh, and uh, on uh, several technical briefings, uh, preparing the background documents for the high level meeting on disability uh, and uh, development, which took place in New York in September 2013. Uh, so uh, um, in, 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 uh, in these in processes, actually in, in my everyday, I would say, uh, uh, in my, my everyday tasks uh, included uh, uh, preparation of background documents for uh, all these uh, events, which uh, I've been discussing with my supervisor of the World Health Organization. Then uh, 
uh, these background documents have been uh, were, were, were sent to uh, uh, other staff of the World Health Organization and the United Nations, and then we were uh, 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 were uh, revising accordingly and preparing the final document. It was it was a really really very interesting uh, 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 process. However, three important I would like to uh, uh, yes uh, to conclude with three important uh, 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 issues. Uh, learning, I, I would say, uh, experience that I had from my secondment. First is the issue of prevention and how to find prevention. Uh, recently, in, a, in an article that was published by the Journal of, uh, in the Journal of Medical uh, Law and Ethics, Janet Lord, uh, from the perspective of the drafters of the convention, admits that it was a, uh, a lost opportunity for the convention not to discuss particularly the issue of prevention. So now in the field of health, we see that this is reframed, not as prevention of disabilities, but as compression of disability-related comorbidity. And here is what we discuss about evidence-based policy and how we bring change. And in order to bring change and policy change, I think that policy change is achieved when people are ready to change, change their views, change their, their, their standpoint, and uh, change their perspective sometimes. And here, this is what uh, I would say I would expect to see from the disability community to change their perspective on the issue of, of, of prevention, uh, <laughs> secondary and primary prevention. The second learning point uh, is, uh, and that will come to the indicators to close uh, this short talk. Uh, we have seen in the field of indicator development several initiatives at the EU level from the ANED, uh, from the Office of the High Commissioner, which very recently published the report on, uh, uh, on um, uh, uh, the guiding principles for human rights monitoring and developing indicators, uh, and several other initiatives from international disability rights monitors. However, this work packet, what this work packet proposes to do is to get deeper into the hard science of indicators development. We have seen that all these, uh, uh, all these projects stay on the surface of indicators. The structure, process, outcome model of developing indicators is really not project science. It has been developed since the 70s and has been applied in uh, several other areas. Uh, we, we expect and uh, I expect from, uh, from uh, this research to uh, contribute new knowledge to the field of uh, developing uh, science-based indicators, discussing particularly uh, indicators from the perspective, uh, not from the perspective, but discussing uh, the, the, the particularities and the specificities of uh, indicators for human rights. Uh, what distinguishes a human rights indicator from a development indicator, from a health indicator? What are the what are what are the uh, the features of an indicator like technical robustness? Uh, uh, how an indicator behaves as a communicating device, and it can be if it can be understandable by the people who want to use it to use an indicator for monitoring the convention, like people with disabilities. Proposing a, a structural process indicator is not enough when people with disabilities cannot use it as a communication device to monitor actually the realization of their own rights. And that is why we bring participatory processes and, uh, and uh, science into, into the field of indicators okay. uh, development. Let's open the debate, so I think we've... Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> so, just one or two quick reactions to kind of thread it together, uh, Demetrius, because um, it's very interesting that you're focusing on rehabilitation. And it's very... Just the word rehabilitation was resisted so much by the NGOs in the negotiations because of the facts, because it dragged them immediately back to decades of what they perceived as oppression through rehabilitation. So it was quite a, how shall I put it, quite a struggle to actually entrench something like rehabilitation in the convention, hopefully on a completely different philosophy relative to the history that they experienced in the past and it's also kind of understandable that Ida would have a problem with the World Disability Report coming from the WHO because in their mind, in their mind, the World Health Organization is really the World Medical Organization, which again brings you back to the facts of medicine being used as an engine of oppression in the past. Now, I think that's slightly unfair to the World Health Organization, but as you point out, the, the value shifts have to go on everywhere, so it's not as if my values in the NGO are absolutely right, and you've got to accommodate yourself to me. He said, well, maybe I have to be a little bit self-questioning as well. Actually, I do think they got it right, <laughs> and they don't have to compromise. So some comments from Jerome, and then we'll open it up to the floor. 
Just, just a very few uh, comments. I mean, the fact value distinction is a very nice way of putting it, perhaps better than the passion reason distinction. Um, and there is a continuum of what you do with facts, what researchers propose with their facts. There's a continuum of, of um, attitudes, if you like. Uh, the, the most, on one extreme is that I just say the facts and everything will take care of itself. And so facts speak for themselves. Obviously naive and uh, ineffective. The other side um, is facts don't matter at all. Uh, and in fact, facts are bad things. Um, uh, there are two ways of um, motivating that. One to say there are no facts, the kind of skepticism about facts. Uh, and to my mind, if, I mean, if one holds that, then the game is up. You just go burn cars. The second, the second approach is one which I've just heard. I've heard several times, but I'm, since I'm not very smart, it takes me a while to absorb from this <laughs> gentleman here, uh, that facts are retrograde. That is to say, facts are only about in the past, not what they should, what they should be in the future. And I, you know, that's a very, very interesting challenge. But it can't be right, though, because if, if you think about it, the only way you can identify movement, change, is change in the realm of facts. I mean, th there used to be this, now we look again, and now it's something different, and that is an improvement with respect to our values. I mean, the, the facts don't <clears throat> identify, excuse me, the facts don't identify the direction that you're going, that's mm -hmm. what the values do, yeah. but, uh, but, the, but the, the facts, um, um, Give it, give you the opportunity to be able to determine if you're making a change, and that is actually what the <laughs> Article 31 is precisely addressing. That is to say, you need the facts to be able to monitor the implementation of the convention. Um, I think either complete skepticism, there is no facts, or my facts and your facts, all that kind of stuff. To my mind, I'm just too old to to bother with stuff like that anymore. I mean, if you want to hold that, then burn cars. But the view that facts are, are bring us back to a previous, is actually valuating facts. To say, not only is it, a, is it a fact that people with intellectual impairments can't make decisions, it should be that way. So it's, it's imbuing the situation with, it's prioritizing a situation. The, the, the facts aren't doing that, it's the overlay that's doing that. And that's where I would question the overlay and direct the issue properly to where it should be, namely, you no, know, your understanding of what the aim, the threshold, the horizon should be is, is wrong. Now, the, the intermediate position between the two extremes of just say the facts and everything will change, the, the Pollyannish view, <clears throat> and facts don't matter because what's a fact, who cares, is something which I'm calling negotiation. That is to say, facts are, are, are what's on the table for negotiation. It's part of the debate that needs to get it right because getting it right is important. It's important not because of the facts. Getting it right is important because of the values. Mm -hmm. But getting it right is a fact of the world. It is not something we invent. We negotiate it and try to map it on to our social world. And, um, you know, so, so. Great. End of story. Uh, I, I would be slightly different in that I would see values embedded in the facts already uh, and representing widespread tacit acceptance of the situation, which is really a judgment on how seriously yeah. you take your values or not. Yeah. And by the way, if you do burn a car, burn a Mercedes, you have much more impact uh, factually yeah. than well, doing a Nissan. And the, don't the, burn a Renault, because I like Renault. Just don't burn my car. Um, <laughs> JB, is JB in the room? Can yeah. somebody do a roving mic? Okay. Oh, and take <coughs> photographs at yeah. the same time. <laughs> so, so I've Andre first, and then Ranvik. Oh, <laughs> then Diane, and then Magdi. The car burner, he's right over there. I don't want to come on the camera now. What I think was interesting in one of the CSR said about the, the change law of the European Court of Justice. One of the things I didn't mention, and I would like also to maybe to stress or to add in also your, your impression about that. Well, when we are speaking about policy implementation, I was speaking about policy makers. I forgot, obviously, the judge. Hmm. Yeah. And the, quite importance of strategic case law. One of the things is quite interesting when I look to what is happening in the recent year 
in the interesting case law. I have two examples, but one example is why the ECG changed its uh, view about uh, disability discrimination from the Chapel Navas case to the case of uh, Coleman, for example. Then you, you see a shift, interesting. Why does it shift happen if you know the values which are embedded in the judge? Because they, 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 they are not, I mentioned how you, what is happening in politics, politicians, but judges are not politicians. Their values, their mindset is totally different. Yeah. And if you have to lobby judge, you have to think in a totally different way. But it's so a rational discourse. The, the thing, Gérard, I, I would like to ask you personally, because if you play, nobody, somebody, many of you, of you maybe know that Gérard played a very interesting role when he was a judge in the Social Chapter Commission. <laughs> And you told me something quite interesting Oops. about all the debates and what was your role in convincing uh, other uh, domestic uh, judge mm. about the, that disability issue and the case of autism in France was an infringement of social rights. What was the, how you, you convinced them with their own values that there was a case against France? Interesting. I'd like to yeah. ask you that. So let's take Ranvig. Um, and Take then, then we'll respond to these two, and then we'll move on to the next two. Thank you very much, and thank you. It was really lovely to hear from your um, from the ESRs. I really enjoyed your, um, your talks, your presentation. Um, I want to challenge both Gerard and Jerome on the <laughs> distinction between facts and values. Mm -hmm. I think that's total nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will give you examples. Um, in Iceland, we have a lot of mountains and um, glaciers and, um, you know, stones and whatever. So that is a fact. Okay. This was for many years um, regarded as useless wasteland. Today, it is the most valuable resource because all the tourists come to Iceland to see this, you know, incredibly beautiful nature that is untouched by the human hand and is really unique in Europe. So, have the facts changed? No, not at all. It's still just mountains and glaciers and stones, but the way we understand it has changed. And that is what is important, is our construction of yeah, yeah. Yeah. what we see and how we negotiate what's important. You know, the impairment of disabled people has not changed, but how we understand disability has changed. So please stop this fact <laughs> it is not helpful at all. I'll give you another really good example. Um, in 2007, Iceland was at the top of the financial um, entrepreneurship in the world. We were the modern day Vikings conquering the economic whatever of the Europe. In 2008, all of our you know, adored Vikings that were making all this progress and all this money, they all overnight became crooks. So, nothing changed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just how we understood them. And so, so I really think it's important that we look at um, this world as a social construction, that we negotiate together what's important, what's meaningful, how to understand things. And um, to see things just as facts of values, it's just not helpful at all. Okay, I'm not sure if this works. Does this Take work? it off the stand and just pull it to now. I don't, does it work? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Andre, do you want to respond to the judge's query? Uh, well, I'll kind of respond to both, I suppose, just to make a comment. I think it's a very relevant point, Randig, and it's how we perceive or whatever, because I mean, that that goes down to how the judges perceive the rights of people with disabilities, also within the limitations that they're working in. So, for example, the European Court of Human Rights, obviously, there's limitations to 
how they can interpret the convention and how the rights of people with disabilities will be thereby affected. But I think it's a, a very relevant point, and it goes back to what Andre was saying that it's the the mindset of how they are interpreting also needs to change. Um, how they are seeing the rights of people with disabilities and um, how they are interpreting the substantive rights at issue. That would just be a small guys. Yes. Come. Uh, I just want to say about the judges that I think the ratification of the convention play a central role in, let's say, the change of the values. Even though I don't think necessarily it's a change of values, I think it's more like the margin of appreciation for their interpretation is much more limited because mm. the convention now is part of the of EU law, mm. so they have to interpret uh, EU legislation based on the convention, and they said that in the in the recent case law. So. I, I won't give them that much credit for, for change of mind, but certainly they did the right thing. So. Mm -hmm. You something to add? No? Um, I, I have to candidly admit to Ranvik that statistics was the only course I ever failed badly <laughs> and consistently, so I have a love-hate relationship with facts myself. Um, I guess when we were talking about values, what we were really talking about is framing, right? And how you can, framing how you radically reframe what actually exists, okay? And I'm sure there were people in Iceland who 20 years ago said, actually, these are our best assets, but weren't listened to. Yeah, that's true. So the interesting thing is, how did that reframing happen? Um, was it that you pointed to an inconsistency between your practice and your, your deeply held values, the Viking nation? Or was it that new values came on the scene, or new ways of producing um, uh, wealth uh, emerged and so forth. So, so when we use values, we mean it loosely to include Respect. reframing, Respect. because Respect. the way you shift that kind of paradigm influences what you see. It influences how you judge it, good or bad. But it also influences how you'd like to develop it and change it. So it's that shift that we're trying to get at, I think. As to Andre's question about the social charter as like a quasi-judicial committee, I think the point I made to you over three really excellent Belgian beers in the past <laughs> was that in any court, in any interpretive body, you're going to get a lump and mass of people who are not interested in the issues and are not intellectually engaged. They might, as a matter of form, say, oh, we've ratified this, it means, but they don't actually from the depths of what that. One or two will, but they're not the ones who will persuade the lump and mass. You've got to have a communicator in the middle who understands where everybody is coming from and gives them some comfort about the shift of framing or the shift of values that's going on. And then before they know it, they sign up to something and that amounts to a radical inflection point in the jurisprudence into the future, inviting cases that they're actually horrified to deal with, uh, but now have to deal with because the precedent has been set. I think that was the only point. Jerome, did you want to add? Well, I, I, I just want to stress that um, that when I understand facts, what I'm talking about are not, when I understand facts, what I'm talking <laughs> about are, th are things that are in the social sphere. They're, they're, I'm, I'm not saying that facts are the things in the world that are, are, I mean, I do say that you run into them, to be sure, but our, our comprehension of things, our understanding, is, is negotiated in a, in, a, in a communal setting. Not politi political, yes, and whatnot. That's why I'm, what really irritates me is the view that uh, I have knowledge which is, is just so special that I can't communicate it. Well, there's no such knowledge like that. I mean, the, knowledge is a public domain. Facts are in the public domain. They're created out of interactions between people. They're not created by individuals. It's, a, it's like a language. So that's why I always think in terms of negotiation, perceptions, interactions between people, creating facts, because that's where they come from. They come from common understandings. Um, and I mean, your Iceland examples, I think, are being discuss. I mean, essentially, I said the same thing you did, that uh, you have to break the uh, dichotomy because they're interactive. I mean, the reason-passion dichotomy is problematic only if you say you only need one and reason is the bad guy. 
when you interact them, when they show that they modulate each other, they affect each other, reason and passion. Facts and values modulate each other in the same way. Okay. When I think of reason and passion, I, I think of Captain Kirk and Spock, but anyhow. Um, <laughs> so let's hand it over to Diane and Magdi, please. Oh, yes, right. Okay. I want to hear what Diane says. Thank you. Um, first of all, full disclosure, I was the chair of the International Disability Alliance while the um, World Report was being prepared and was part of the committee that reviewed early drafts and wrote some of those papers that um, that were reviewed. Um, and the second um, issue is that, as I said earlier, I'm an advocate, not a researcher. Um, and I can feel my blood boiling right now. Um, <laughs> largely uh, supporting what Randvik said, but also I think Gerard's comments. Um, Margaret Wheatley has written that often issues are invisible because people don't have a framework for being able to understand them. And I think that that's really what disability rights advocates have been up against. And voice was not recognized as fact. And voice and experience are fact. Um, but they aren't given the same legitimacy. And so just as an example, with um, the World Report on Disability, which I, I do think, um, to give credit to the people who, who worked on it, um, enormous progress was made from the earlier drafts. Um, I think there is a problem presenting to the world that disability is a health issue, as opposed to framing it from a social perspective, even if the world couldn't frame it as a rights issue, at least as a, as a social issue. But, um, and just a, a very small point on the prevention issue is that I prefer talking about health promotion because we want everyone to be as healthy as possible um, rather than suggesting that we're trying to eliminate um, certain people, which is the way things end up getting understood. But specifically on the World Report and um, and research, the education chapter in particular, relies on research that was done on old models because that's what we were told exists as fact. There's, there was not good research on inclusion. And so at the launch of the World Report, one of the uh, people that they got to comment on the chapter on education was Cor Mayer, who's the executive director of the European Agency for Special Needs Education, which is formed by all the ministries of education in, in Europe. And you, know, you would think that they rely on facts. And his critique of the chapter was that um, he said there's no more argument about whether there should be inclusive education, that what the chapter should have focused on is how to do it. And so, you know, but right now, that's what stands out there. It, there's a very equivocal position on education, and it's based on an, you know, an outdated framework and um, and outdated research that itself comes from a very particular perspective. And if they had relied on different kinds of research and voice, there would have been a different conclusion. Fabulous. Magdi. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. I'd just like to make a few points. So I'm a sociologist. I'm aware of the importance of data collection and facts and figures. However, in the disability context, and it's really a question to Jerem, I guess, that I don't know how to overcome. I think it's kind of a contradiction that the CRPD considers disability as an evolving concept, has no definition in the CRPD. And in order to collect these facts, you end up creating a rigid definition of disability and determining who is disabled and who is not. And for me, it's a, it's a very concerning point when it comes to who will be entitled to make these this definitions um, and so on. And we could go on with this discussion. But my other point regarding facts is that I think it's very dangerous if we think, for instance, about that the European Commission uh, in relation to the Accessibility Act is trying to make the business case because of EU competences it's easier to put the whole disability agenda under the you know the market competences and it, what if the facts show that it's not worth investing in accessibility 
So for me, the facts and the values in this distinction, like, like we have the values, like it's not a question for me if uh, accessibility should happen uh, for all persons with disabilities, for all persons in Europe. Like, um, and I, I think this is also very concerning because we collect facts and all these uh, commission initiatives which might show that from the business perspective there is no um, interest in doing so if we consider accessibility in a very, very holistic manner. And my last point is just regarding the case law. So I'm not a lawyer and I don't want to seem too skeptical, but the Kish case, uh, his name is actually pronounced Kish and I think it's very uh, disrespectful in many ways that people just call him Kish, especially because he never wanted his name to be uh, mentioned. So the case was running under Kate for a long while and he wanted to preserve his confidentiality. And you know, it's very interesting how this case law that gets just treated in the international academic world. Um, so I think this is one of the most frequently mentioned cases when it comes to disability. And if we just think, so what happened with him? And what happened uh, with him, uh, with uh, people like him in Hungary, like nothing. So even if these core decisions come out, like many years ago now, I have to say, but it's true also for the Stanev case and all these, you know, same cases, like nothing has changed. And I think it's very tricky to really, and it's not against Andrea and I love her project and she knows that, but like anywhere I go at conferences, these are the, the positive case law examples, which are actually very negative examples because it just shows that even if you have an enforcement decision uh, issued by the court, it does not change at all, uh, even if like my country, Hungary, uh, changed the civil code like a year and a half ago, uh, maintaining the same, uh, you know, uh, guardianship, uh, like a bit different, but still very, very bad guardianship regime. And he, he she's still under guardianship, he still cannot vote at the elections, just, you know, for anyone's interest. So I think these are important things. To Good point. About. We've time for one more question. Uh, Lisa down the back, and then we'll uh, all go on, and <laughs> Kelly as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Andre, you asked a very interesting question about those two cases, and I want to say something about the role of case law and why courts do like change their mind. And you made a comparison between Shackle and Lovas, this very narrow medical model uh, of, of individual model of disability, and you compared and you said, why did the courts change its mind when it came to Coleman? So Shackle and Lovas, about 2004, 2005, Coleman. Uh, about 2008. In Coleman, the court said um, a mother who was discriminated against because she had a child with a disability was protected uh, by uh, EU non discrimination law. Um, now, the court actually would say, we didn't change our mind. Chateau Mlavas was about one thing, uh, the definition of disability. Coleman was about something else. And they did say that in their judgment, that this is discrimination by association. Um, but there was a very big difference in mentality there, is it, between the two judgments. And tell us, it, it was not the UN Convention. The Coleman yeah. was just was too early. The, the, the court uh, was not aware that the UN Convention wasn't relevant. The EU hadn't ratified it. What mattered, I think, very much is the opinion of the world of individuals, and particularly the opinion of the Advocate General, so the people who advise the court. Chapel Novas, we had, let's say, uh, we had Advocate General Helmut, who let's say he's one of these people who didn't know what he was talking about, really. You know, disability, well, that's a medical limitation, so here's my view. And the court, well, they didn't know much about it either. Well, our Advocate General gave us this advice, it sounds reasonable, let's do this. When we came to um, Colum, we had a very different Advocate General, maybe you've heard of him, Miguel Cuadros Maduro. Now, this, this is a man who's an academic. He did, wrote his PhD in, in, at the European University Institute. He was an academic, he then became an advocate general, and he is a very, he's a brilliant man. He knows what he's talking about, and he really gave some thought to this. And he was saying we should, it's not about, you know, it's not about whether someone is disabled or not, or not. it's uh, the question of um, whether the discrimination was on the ground of disability, and we should be protecting everyone, not who is discriminated on the ground of disability. So he had this, this vision, this understanding. He was someone who was really engaged. And the court was convinced by his arguments. Uh, what happened to Miguel Cuadros Maduro afterwards? He, after he left the, the court, he finished his uh, office uh, period as Advocate General, 
And he went on to become a minister in Portugal, government minister. Um, now we're talking about turning ideas into change that transform lives. And Miguel Puerto Maduro is an academic who was in a position to use his ideas, to use his knowledge to really transform lives because he was in that position of the Advocate General and convinced the court. So my message to the ESRs is that an academic in the right place, at the right time, with the right knowledge, can make a huge difference. And I think that is the core difference between, or one of the core differences between um, uh, Chacon and Novas. The court didn't know what they were talking about, and there was no one who was there to actually tell them uh, what, the, what, the, what, the, what they give them some good advice and call them where they had an, an academic and uh, a lawyer who really did know uh, what was going on. So Thanks a lot, Lisa. Change lives. Thanks very much. A strange way it validates Andre's core thesis, which is that you've got to be in the right place at the right time with the right, right. ideas. So there's two more on the list. I'm, I'm cognizant of the stubborn fact that you need coffee. So um, one is Kelly, the other is Anna, and then we'll ask Jerome and the ESRs to sum up and respond up. briefly, and then have a cup of coffee. <laughs> Um, I've been a researcher for about 20 years, mostly with people with disabilities. And I guess the thing that's driven me a lot is, um, is one of the motivators for my research. It's actually a poem by T.S. Eliot. It comes from Little Giddy. And I just want to throw it in as a comment around the earlier discussion around values and facts. Mm -hmm. In Little Giddy, um, the, the two lines that really stand out for me are, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to return to the place where we began and see it as if for the first time. And I think that that is what research is often about. It is seeing what we have seen always, but seeing it again from a totally different perspective. I worry when we talk about facts and research and I worry because of the history, the long history with people with disabilities. In the early 20th century, people had facts which said that people with intellectual disabilities were a threat to the gene pool. People had facts that said these people were immoral, poor, and should be segregated. Those facts were part of a whole practice that led to many, many people leaving their lives in institutions. I think as researchers, we have a real responsibility to be aware of the limits of our research findings, to be sure, as sure as we can be, limited though we are, about the wider social and economic context in which our research is done and in which it is read. And I think we also, have a very strong responsibility to mediate the voices of people because everyone's got a voice. The problem for many people is that those voices are not heard. And I think that our research is important for those reasons. It's for those reasons that we seek to have impact on policy and practice. And so I, I do worry about a focus that tends to say that it's a balance that we need. Wonderful, and I think there's lots of very interesting messages coming through for the ESRs, and it'd be interesting to hear their response. Anna? Um, I think, um, I'll be really brief, um, in, in the interest of coffee, um, <laughs> but I think kind of what I feel like is actually coming out of this discussion um, is one thing that maybe Jerome and Jared to some extent has left out of, of what you've been talking about, and that is is power and privilege. Um, and I think I felt similarly to what Diane said, um, blood boiling, because you actually can't leave that out of a discussion of negotiating facts and values, because in any negotiation, power dynamics come into play, particularly in a capitalist system, which is, is the reality of what we live in. Um, and there will always be marginalized groups um, and, and that don't have power, and we can't ignore that people with disabilities, however you want to define it, um, I mean, and one way to define it is those people who have an impairment who are marginalized. Um, and, and that is a group that 
I mean, definitely exists now and um, can't be ignored in terms of the power dynamics that are at play there. And the reality that that negotiation between facts and values is a very difficult one when you don't have power. Excellent. So I just asked the ESRs under a minute each to both respond and sum up from their perspective what you've learned here today, basically. Thanks. I just want to specifically comment on Magdi's um, point. Um, I totally agree what you're saying, Magdi, but I think you've misunderstood what I was saying. Basically, what I said is there's a very progressive equality norm. The court is showing strides towards equality. However, this didn't necessarily translate to the rights of people with disabilities. So in fact, what you said confirms what I meant. So in that case in particular, the right, uh, they profess this great blanket ban on the right to vote is um, unacceptable. However, it doesn't necessarily translate down to the rights of people with disabilities, and that's the whole point of my project and the theory that I was trying to say. So I think maybe there was just a bit of mis misunderstanding there. Also, just for Andre's point earlier, it just occurred to me, I've recently done um, research on Roma education, and I was just thinking when you talked about shift in mindset, um, the recent Horvath uh, Kish case, um, in that case, the, the court is very progressive on the segregation of Roma children and in fact goes as far as saying that states have uh, positive obligations to remedy structural deficiencies in Roma educa education. So I just, that just occurred to me in terms of where does this leave the mindset of the court when it comes to segregation of disabled children and can that translate to the segregation of disabled children? So it's just a kind of a funny point in terms of where the court is on one group and where it is on another um, disadvantaged group. Uh, yes, Lisa, you're right. I just meant the, the couple of decisions after the ratification of the convention that changed the definition of disability. So, so Monty's points, uh, I, I really agree. I'm also kind of an idealist. I wish values were enough to persuade people, even though we don't know if our values are the correct values from the whole discussion also, so that's kind of dangerous. But yeah, but values have not proven enough to, to, to pass the, the equality directive. And this was a risk that the commission took, but I think we need to make that argument and we need to have more data on that because we kind of function in this kind of uh, system and we have to work through the system to make change, I suppose. I really agree with the comment that was made about not relying solely on facts because facts as we've seen can be warped um, in ways that aren't very positive. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that in, in law, in both the international and national arena, uh, we can um, use the facts and research together um, to help move society and law together um, <coughs> to equality for everyone in, in every 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 way. So I, I think that law and society really end up affecting each other because the norms of both really have a way of pushing the other in one way or another. And um, I hope that as dream researchers we can go out and work to keep both of these Sometimes we might have evidence-based measures which are human rights inspired, but the value, the particular values, may not be <coughs> the same with other uh, actors. So here, I'm not here, of course, to, to defend the world's form of disability, but I would like to defend the UN system and its processes. 
saying by 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 saying that uh, uh, the World Economic Stability and other policy recommendations have been endorsed by 194 states in the World Health Assembly. The WHO has normative authority and powers. Yeah. That's enough. Sum up. Sum up. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm signing okay. up. Yeah. Has normative authority and powers to issue policy recommendations, and uh, this has been uh, agreed uh, among uh, among all states. So uh, applying the law à la carte, saying that we recognize the UN authority to issue a disability treaty convention, but we don't recognize the authority of a UN specialized agency to prescribe the, the exact measures to make this treaty a reality, it's like <coughs> applying, on a, applying the law and accepting the authorities of the UN on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think that, that we should reconsider our approach to, uh, to the whole processes and systems of human rights implementation. OK, thanks. So, Jerome? D just one point. First of all, Anna, obviously you're dead right, I'm, and I, I didn't emphasize it enough. Negotiation is only, I, I, put, I tried to get it all in mutual respect. That's not part, that's not enough. It has to be mutual empowerment as well. I mean, negotiation is free and equal and respectful only in the context of, of I mean, I, I would have hoped you would have thought that I knew that. But anyway, it's good, it's good to be reminded of that. Um, just one, one comment, I mean, there are interesting things about facts um, here. Um, now, it's not, a, it's not a, the problem of factness that we get it wrong. That doesn't mean facts are wrong, because that would really be paradoxical. The, uh, we used to understand that people with intellectual impairments, well, we were wrong, <laughs> okay? I mean, it's not the, the fact, it's not a problem with factness that we, we make mistakes. Uh, because if it is, and there are no facts, then it's not a fact that people deserve to be respected either. It's not a fact that people should make their own decisions either. If, I think those are facts. I think there's good evidence for the fact that a person makes decisions about themselves is an important thing for them to have. That's, to my mind, is a fact that we pro progress toward it is a value goal. If you say, no, it's not a fact that people should make decisions about themselves, that's just a value, then I, well, then, okay, you can see where I'm Thanks going with this. <laughs> so so it's, it's definitely a fact that Italy are out of the World Cup, but I bemoan it yes. from my value <laughs> perspective. Uh, the former uh, British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, was once asked, what was the most complicating thing to deal with during his premiership, and he, he said it's something like events, dear boy, events, but he could, <laughs> he could have said facts, dear boy, <laughs> facts. So it's a nice kind of bridge into the next session, which is all Sadly about fact. how the evidence was mustered to change the EU structural rules, uh, structural fund rules, the kind of alliances that were built, and most importantly, and going back to Kelly's point, how the silent voices were actually brought to the table and allowed to speak for themselves. And, and I think um, Magdi's point about, we can be great at getting the facts right, but you know, in that process, there's almost, um, I won't call it inevitable, but in probabilistic terms, it's highly probable that we're going to be objectifying the human existence. And the raw edge then of the human experience is totally, totally, totally forgotten about quote unquote, the scientific researcher gathering the facts. So that's why I think we need the corrective. It's not just a corrective, it's really an inflection point of bringing up voices of people with disabilities yeah, yeah, yeah. themselves, right. and they being the primary researchers into the future. So now it's a fact that you've earned the right to have coffee. Thanks. Exactly. Uh, please congratulate all the ESRs. I think it was great to come.